Well, Razorback fans, as much fun as it was, spring football did come to an end, and there was actually a few things to take away from it. So let's talk about it on today's Locked On Razorbacks podcast. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I am also the host of the John Neighbors Show, which you can catch every weekday afternoon from 4 to 6 on Natty State Sports and NattyStateSports.com. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more, where right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Hope everybody had a wonderful weekend, as I know it's been so chaotic and so crazy with uh, so many things happening in the Razorback side of things. We're actually going to hit all three of the major sports here on the show today. Uh, as there's plenty of things to react to. We'll talk some basketball. We'll talk some baseball. But I, I did want to give a little bit of love for football because you talk about something that's been put to the back burner over the past couple weeks even. And not saying it's a bad thing, but football in the spring has not really been a high priority for people. In fact, it's been quite the opposite. Of all the sports going on, I think the Razorback football might be the one that people are least interested in. I mean, it makes sense. It's not the season, so there's there's some reasoning behind it. But, you know, uh, we had the chance to watch the spring game or the red-white game, whatever you want to call it. Like, I always get kind of tired of, like, however many people are like, ah, well, what's it called? Is it called the red-white game? It's called the spring game? called the spring scrimmage? doesn't matter. Uh, but on Saturday, we got to witness it there in Fayetteville at Razorback Stadium. Uh, you know, first off, before we get into it, spring games used to mean so much, or at least they tried to make it a thing. And there's sometimes there will be some places around the country that'll put forth a lot of, you know, excitement and have a lot of people there. But uh, the crowd was actually decent. Uh, this was the first time I feel like in a while they've had the spring game not during a Razorback baseball series at home, which was nice. But all things considered, I thought the crowd was pretty, pretty decent. Maybe like 20,000 people there, 15,000, maybe. I don't know. I'm terrible at guessing crowds. But it's just, I like the fact that it's not as big a deal as what people would try to make it out to be before, because before it was just a facade. But either way, there were a few things that stood out, though, from the spring practice. And uh, we'll try to dive into it. And folks, if you want to hear and see more coverage, you can go to NightStateSports.com and be able to check it out there, too. But I will say the side of things that was most fascinating this whole spring has been Bobby Petrino in the offense. And I've come on this podcast and discussed all the things that have been seen from the offense. You know, Taylor Green's QB1. Uh, there's been some other guys that I really liked uh, you know, that, that have stepped in there. But when it comes to just the spring game in general, that was about as good of a performance at quarterback by Taylor Green that you could ever want. I know it's a spring game. I know he was going up against the second-team defense. I, I get all that. I understand all that. So don't yell at me about it. But you know what? I would rather have my quarterback, my starting quarterback, perform well against the second-team defense in a spring game than not. Okay? So keep that into consideration. But Taylor Green, as far as his actual stats, he went 17-22 to for 243 yards and three touchdowns. Great numbers there. Now I'll admit... Leading up into the spring game in the final week, week and a half of spring practices and that we got to watch in the media, Taylor Green did not look good. He struggled. He was airmailing a few passes. He threw into coverage. He seemed uncomfortable. And not that I was concerned or worried about it, but I was a little bit like, oh, that's not what you want to see. You want to see improvement as the year goes on. You want to see improvement as the spring goes on. And... There's a lot of factors that could play into that. Could be the defense was improving too. Maybe they were starting to figure them out. But either case, Dalen Green was masterful. And I know you could look at the stats and say, oh, yeah, those are pretty good stats. But if you go back and watch the highlights of it, he was throwing dimes. There were some passes that were big league, big time, right there in the bread basket, dropping it in right there perfectly for their wide receivers. I mean, that was phenomenal. And a lot of it had to do with guys like Tyrone Broden and Andrew Armstrong, who led the entire day in, in receiving yards. Not surprising. Both of them had a touchdown. And when that happened, I started looking back in the spring, and I was like, you know those times when Taylor Green didn't look as good? 
was really when Tyrone Broden wasn't in practice because he was dealing with a family matter, and Andrew Armstrong was a little bit banged up, and he wasn't playing as much too. So maybe not having your two best, biggest targets out there on the field might have something to say about it or have something to do with the struggles. But Taylor Green was awesome. There was a few times, too, where he used his legs, could have took off running and continued to run. But due to, you know, they don't have any tackling on the quarterback, they blow the whistle early. Not saying that he would have gone away for a touchdown, but it would have been interesting to see what he could have done with it. Uh, I think that that's just, once again, shows his ability when it comes to the type of quarterback that he could end up being. After that, Malachi Singleton went 3 of 6, 84 yards and a touchdown. Criswell, Jacoby Criswell went 3 of 8 for 19 yards. Um, You know, I I feel for Criswell, but I just don't think that this is going to be a place for him. I I feel like he might transfer. He will transfer. That's just my guess. Nothing has happened yet, but that would make sense. And then KJ Jackson, who I really like, I really like for him is the future. 15-22 15 to 22 for 107 yards, did have an interception, but as a true freshman, as a guy who's supposed to be in high school right now, and having his spring semester in high school, uh, he's he's got all the pieces to really be a big-time quarterback. So I love Taylor Green. Jaquindon Jackson, this running back dude, the transfer from Utah, he's he's gonna do, he's gonna be the man. Dude is like 6'2, 6'3, 235 pounds, strength, speed, athleticism. Hits the hole hard, runs with reckless abandon. He's going to be a fun player. He's going to be a really fun player to watch. And I think he's going to be, at the end of the day, the biggest running back on this team as far as stats go and all that. Rashad Dabinian looked good, too. He only had three carries for 38 yards, but uh, we'll talk a little bit reason as, as to why. Isaiah Gustav, seven rushes, 10 yards, but as was uh, reported and that was put out, just uh, yesterday, he has officially announced that he will be entering into the transfer portal. So I hate to see that because I thought that he would be somebody that maybe could could break off and do something. But uh, he put out there, quote, first and foremost, I want to thank Coach Pittman and the rest of the coaching staff for blessing me with the opportunity to play the game I love. Thank you to all my teammates. I'm very grateful for the time I spent with you all. After long conversations with my family, I'd like to announce I'm officially entering my name into the transfer portal with three years of eligibility left. It's time to do what's best for me. Thank you, Og Nation. So I wish him nothing but the best. He was a four-star player out of Florida. Had 202 yards and a touchdown on 35 attempts last year. So, again, wish him nothing but the best. But I understand, you know, you want to go and play. You want to you want to be in a place that, you know, you, you suits you. And let's be honest, too. Uh, when your coach, Jimmy Smith, leaves, kind of opens it up for uh, you to take that leap. So, I don't blame him at all, but Braylon Russell, the true freshman, that dude's a big old boy. Five rushes, 38 carries, and a touchdown. So, again, the the, the wide receivers were really good. I was really impressed by them, the, the rushing. The offensive line, though, is really where I want to give a lot of credit to. You know, against practice, second team, take that into consideration. But I, compared to what it was last year, I was really impressed by the way that the offensive line was able to open up so many great holes for these running backs. Like those three carries that Rashad DeBinion had, I mean, you think about three carries, 38 yards, he's averaging – over 10 yards of carry. Every single one of those was because of the hole that the offensive line opened up. I felt like Taylor Green was really well protected. We'll see how it plays out, but I was very impressed by what he was able to do and what the offensive line was able to do here in, in this particular deal. Now, the defense is always going to be the fascinating one, too. Uh, I mean, Landon Jackson's amazing. No, no, no surprise there. I think Nico Davier had a really nice game, too, in, in the spring game. Jalen Braxton looked good. Uh, you know, I, I think he had an interception there. And how about Slaughter, uh, the transfer from Tennessee? He's worked his way up into the first team, and Snacks Johnson's working with the twos. So I don't know if you want to say that's good or bad, but at least you want to add as much depth as you can and as much as possible. But the guy that stood out to me defensively was Brad Spence, the linebacker, because we know linebackers, man, it's it's so, so lean and slim over there on uh, the Razorback roster. We know that. And Xavion Sori is the transfer from Georgia, five, former five-star everyone has been excited about. But Spence showed that he, I don't know how good he's going to be. I don't know if he's going to be an All-American, All-SEC, whatever. But at least he showed me that he is an SEC caliber linebacker. He, he showed that he, he can be that guy. He can be that dude. Now, they're going to need more than just him. But I, I liked what I saw from him and uh, the ability that he has. And then, the let's be honest, about the upside that he has. The upside could be really good, too. So, yeah, uh, other things of note, uh, the punting was really good. I really The punting, 
I thought everybody did good. Max Fletcher did good. All the others did good. The kicking, not the best game. Not the best day. Uh, Vito Calvaruso, I think, will be fine. Well, they'll be fine against one game, one spring game. But you definitely don't want to see that. You want to see guys being pretty automatic within 40 yards in, and that wasn't the case. So they got to work on that. They got to get better at that. But, again, I liked what I saw. It, it looked fine. It looked better than maybe what some people thought. Got to see Darren McFadden out there, which was pretty cool. He's hanging out on the sidelines. The weather was pretty nice. So, overall, as spring football comes to an end, and as football season, talking season, will get revved up here in a few months, that was about as good as you could ask. But we'll see how the rest plays out. Talk a little basketball here in just a second. When you're hiring for your small business, folks, you want to find quality professionals for that right role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn is not just a job board. LinkedIn helps you fire professionals that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't exactly actively searching for a new job, but might be open to the perfect role. In any given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking on the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or the resources to do any hiring, but they're going to help you out with that. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, moving on into the next segment of the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. If there was a question that I get more than anything, I was out there at the spring game, and pe- fans came up to me and asked the same question. I went out, uh, was uh, meeting with some clients and some potential sponsors with United State Sports. And when I was out there on, in the downtown area, people came up to me and were asking, and so now it's like, uh, I guess i got to talk about it here, too. No. Arkansas and John Calipari, at the moment of the recording of this podcast, have not had any additional commitments. Plain and simple. They haven't had any yet, but I'm telling you, folks, it's going to happen. It's going to happen, and they're going to be big-time players. Just being frank with you. I think that... Jaden Quaintance and Carter Knox are the ones to watch. Those are the ones that were committed to Kentucky, true freshmen, especially Quaintance, who's the number one, uh, number eight player in the country, according to Don Three. I believe that those guys are, I'm not saying for sure, but those are definitely the biggest names to watch in this particular situation. You also have uh, Samtos Cyril, who decommitted also from Kentucky. And he's a 6'10", 240 center from Nigeria. So he, he's a name to watch. And then you'll have some other guys out of the transfer portal to watch too. So, yeah, I mean, it, there's just – there's so many different names that uh, could end up happening. Even the the big Z, as they called him, uh, from Kentucky. He's seven foot two, 234 pounds. He's from Croatia. Zavimir Isovic. I, I don't know if that's how you say his name, but I remember always everyone talking about him. But from what I understand from uh, our guys with United States Sports is that he is going to be one that is going to join the Razorbacks. He hasn't officially said it, but that's who people are thinking it's going to be a pretty good chance that he'll be jumping into it. There'll be some other transfers. There'll be some other guys they contact. But as of right now, that's, that's the latest. And again, you can go to UnitedStatesSports.com uh, to give the, the latest on the big portal board that Curtis and Scott are doing a great job with. Uh, also, in some other things, too, Tremont Mark. The Razorback that was on the team last year, he entered in the portal. Not to say that he was a guy that was going to be contacted or recruited by John Calipari, but it was a name being thrown in there as a possibility. Well, you can remove him because he officially committed to Texas on Sunday. So, Tremont Mark and Jalen Catalan going to Texas. Uh, But here's the thing. I don't have any problems with Tremont Mark going to Texas. It's from his home state. Wishing nothing but the best of luck. You know, Uh, who, who knows? Calipari may not even wanted him. I don't know. I don't know, but he's making that jump. He's making that leap, and you got to wish him nothing but the best, and we'll see how it plays out. I know that battle is still into the mix. 
And that might be really the only ones as far as the uh, former players that are in the transfer portal of what they're going to be looking at. So there you have it. There is the ultimate interest of uh, the big portal board and who Arkansas may be targeting and, and everything. But I will say this. We'll keep you up to date on here, and we'll discuss it anytime something pops or some players join. But I will say this to kind of go on a tangent. The fact that you had so many Kentucky people, where they, they announced Mark Pope yesterday as their head coach of the Kentucky Wildcats, and they packed out Rupp Arena. And it was like, you know, great. I mean, Kentucky's a very passionate fan base and a very historic basketball program, and that's great and all. But there were so many people, like, I felt like were really forcing it. Like, some of the media members over there were just like, oh, I've never seen anything like this. This is one of the coolest moments ever because they had a lot of people there. It's just like, okay. And that's fine. But when they started trying to flex on Arkansas, where they're like, oh, here's the picture. Here's a picture of Arkansas's press conference with Cal, and then here's ours. It's like, it's, Kentucky's just different. First off, uh, I don't even want to mention the media member's name. Uh, he's a guy over there, but he, he like, used a heavily cropped photo of Arkansas in Bud Walton Arena, which it's like, why? If you have to crop the photo to prove your point, then your point's not really being well made. That's for one. But two, yeah, Kentucky fans and the fan base of Kentucky is much bigger. It is. It, it, it always has been, and it probably always will be. So I don't really know what the point of that was. Not to mention the fact that when Kentucky hired Mark Pope, or at least had this official announcement, press conference, whatever, it was on a Sunday afternoon instead of on a Wednesday night when the pouring rain. I don't know if there would have been 20,000 people showing up for Cal Perry if he was announced on a Sunday afternoon, but I guarantee you if it was a day like Sunday was here in Arkansas where the weather was really nice, I think it was 80 degrees and sunny, if it was something like that, I promise you there would have been, <laughs> you would have noticed an inordinate amount of people there. I mean, shoot, there were eight, 9,000 people there as it is. So I just think it's so weird. It's like, you get, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be great for the rivalry. But man, the fact that those Kentucky people are trying so freaking hard to stretch this out and make some connection correlation, it's like, say what you want. Mark Pope may end up being great. But if you, he, the guy hasn't won an NCAA tournament game. You know, like there, there's so many coaches out there that say all the right things and do the right things, but it doesn't mean that they actually play and do really well there. So just relax, relax. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL and baseball's in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shops to home runs, Slam dunks, all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so final segment here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Um, Baseball did go on the road against Alabama in Tuscaloosa, and they lost their very first SEC series of the season. And I'm fine with it. Like, I, I, okay, let me let me just say that. We'll talk about some of the problems, but it it's going to happen. It was bound to happen, and I'd rather it happen right now than later in the season. Alabama's a solid team, decent team. Arkansas had their moments and had their chances, but just couldn't come up with it. And there it is. So the pressure of that, you know, oh, undefeated in SEC play and SEC series and stuff can finally go by the wayside. That's, that's the positive. However, Arkansas did win the first game and looked really impressive. Second game went to extras. Peyton Holt had an incredible just big acorns type of home run where Arkansas was down one, solo shot, was able to tie it up. But in extra innings, it was just not meant to be. The real disappointing thing was on Sunday, though, where Arkansas got shut out. They lost five to nothing, five to nothing in this game. Arkansas had four hits on Sunday. And all those hits came from Jared Sprague lot and Ben McLaughlin, like, like Laughlin. Like you had everybody else 
Ofer. Ofer. Arkansas got six guys on base. Just couldn't get any sort of conversion there. And it's really unfortunate, too, because Brady Tiger did an outstanding job. Five innings pitched, gave up five hits, only one run. He did his job. And Cody Frank came in. Will McIntyre gave in, came in. They gave up a few runs there in the seventh and eighth. Gave up a couple runs, but just, again, frustrating. Frustrating. And what's crazy is Arkansas only struck out six times. So they got contact. You know, they 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 got in scoring position or they got some guys in scoring position. Only walked twice, but just <laughs> you can't win if you can't score. And this has been honestly one of the concerns for this baseball team this year, but also for the year. Because on Sundays going up against usually like a guy like Zane Adams, who was the uh, pitcher for Alabama, he dude went eight innings and only had ninety seven pitches. With five strikeouts. That's just terrible. You, you kept hitting. You kept. You, you, they kept making plays defensively. They got it. But the point is, is like, you got on Sundays. You got to score. You got to get it going. You got to do it. Those are the times where really the offense should open up. And so that's the disappointing thing. Arkansas was always going to lose a series. Again, I get it. Don't get me wrong. I knew it was going to happen, but. In the in the in the deciding rubber match, your first rubber match of the season, you don't score a run. You get four hits, two walks. You're talking about six times you had runners on base. Only six times in this game. Just really unfortunate. Really unfortunate. So Either way, hopefully Arkansas can bounce back from this. It's not the end of the world. Don't freak out. It's just Pitching did its job. Offense has got to step up, too, and hopefully they do here very soon because it's not going to get any easier for them. A lot of games coming up, a lot of tough matchups, and another road trip happening this weekend as well. Appreciate everybody listening in and watching in to the Locked on Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at the John Neighbors Show for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have, and we'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. We'll see you then.